other than Liverpool, the early wins on on the network could be in 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 Hull and in the East Coast area where there is no need for land grab and there, and there would be no need for CPOing. And so we we were disappointed, um, but we look towards T the TFM board to ensure that we're not forgotten in a wider settlement for the North going forward. So thank you for that, Darren. Your point is well made and well noted. As you know, as a TFM board, we speak for the whole of the North, from North Lincolnshire to Berwick and across to uh, Cumbria and down to the Welsh borders. Um, and therefore, we want to make sure that we get the right investments for each part of the North. Thank you, Darren, for that contribution. Okay, I'll move on now to item two, which is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations which any member of the board wishes to add to for this meeting? That shall take silence for assent. I'll then move to item three, the minutes of our board meeting on the 11th of June, which again was primarily a public meeting with one reserved item on de de debate about the detail of our investment plan. So we had a, a big update on operational rail. We did the first reading debate on the economic recovery plan and then in private on the investment plan. Um, we'll cover the investment plan at the very end of the meeting because it was a private discussion, so it needs private validation of those minutes. But on the public part of the meeting, which is what you've seen in front of you as a board paper, can I have approval for the minutes of the 11th of June? And again, I'll take silence for assent after a short pause. Thank you very much, colleagues. I think Barry and I believe that the, oh, yes, I think I have a raised hand. Is that from Peter Cannon? Um, thank you, Chair. It, it was not about the approval of the minutes. It was about points arising in the minutes. So I was just coming on to that, Peter, and then the floor is now yours. Please pursue your point. Thank you. Uh, it was noted that um, under operational rail update at 4.11 in the minutes, um, that the LEPs should be involved um, in potential changes. And uh, I think I made the point predominantly because we're not involved in Rail North. Um, neither are we involved in the Northern Expert Panel that's been established. And so perhaps one of the points is um, if the Northern Expert Panel has met, we could perhaps get an update about what has happened in it. And uh, that would be helpful. And of course, this all ties back into the Northern um, Transport Acceleration Council that's just been established as well, where again we're not involved directly. So I think it's even more important on this, on this operational side uh, and developments that we, we are consulted on a regular basis, Chair. Absolutely agree, Peter, and thank you for reiterating that point. Um, I'll leave uh, Barry and the team to take it up with you offline on your matter arising related to the minutes. But can I just reiterate for this set of minutes an absolute commitment from me as chair and from Barry as chief executive to the best possible way to involve LEPs in all the activities of this board. And if there are parts where there has to be a committee made up of statutory authorities, such as the Rail Committee, because they are all Rail authorities, um, then we must make sure you have full opportunity for involvement. I know Barry is very committed to that, uh, Peter, and we'll make sure it happens. Any other matters arising? OK, I'll leave it at that then, and we'll move to the governance paper. Um, now, however expeditely we try to handle this meeting, Governance is hugely important. It must be done and be seen to be done. And I'm going to hand over in a moment to Deborah, TFM lawyer, who will take us through the governance items on which she needs decisions. Obviously, that will be under the <coughs> meeting stewardship of the chair. But I can't chair item A under four because it's about the appointment of the chair. So I think the logical thing for me to do is to hand over to one of the vice chairs, and I'm simply going to suggest I hand it over to Louise Gitting as the majority group vice chair and then ask her to authorise um, Deborah to uh, undertake that part of the meeting. 
and I will step out of the meeting and then rejoin it. Thank you very much. Louise. Thank you, uh, Chair. So um, are we happy to authorise Deborah to take over this part of the meeting in terms of talking through the governance items that are required? Um, I will uh, take a silence as a sense. Okay, that's fine. Deborah, do you want to introduce yes. this? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes. As this is the annual meeting of the board, there are a number of governance items that are required to be addressed. And clearly the first is the annual election of the chair and the vice chairs. This is a requirement of both the constitution and of the, of the regulations. So the first thing to do, Chair, is, is to call for nominations for the chair of the board. Thank you. Um, so, do I have any nominations for chair of the board? I think Darren's put his hand up. Obviously, we'll move John Cridland. Okay, thank you. Can I just second that? Okay. Um, do, do we... Did you, Deborah, did you get the second? Who yeah. seconded? Uh, Councillor yes. Keith Little. Councillor Keith Little. Councillor Keith Little, yeah. Okay, um, do we have any other nominations? Okay, so we have John Cridland nominated and seconded to be chair of the board. Um, I'm going to ask you um, to approve this. And um, once again, if this is okay, Deborah, um, if we go by, if, if anybody is against this, could they please now say? I think that's, is that long enough for pause? Yeah, there, are no, there are no raised hands and no comments against that, Chair. Okay, okay that's fine. So uh, John Cridland has been um, elected as Chair of the Board. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. So next, do we invite John back? If we can invite John back, because the next item is the election of the Vice Chairs. Okay. John, would you like to come back? Louise, thank you. Thank you for handing up. Um, and can I just thank colleagues for their continuing support, which is both appreciated and in the proper sense of the word humbling. Um, clearly, these are very important times for transport for the North. We have a lot to get right in the coming months. Can I just make a, just a general comment and then move back to Deborah? I remain available to any board member from any of our authorities, whether Metro Mayors, Council Leaders, Council Members, uh, LEP Chairs, LEP Members and Delivery Partner Members. Uh, I think the Chair should be accessible. If you ever want to contact me, please feel free to do so and I'll do my best to make sure that we involve Members in all the appropriate ways that we need to do. But thank you for your continuing support. It remains as ever a pleasure to be involved in this important mission. So what I'm going to do now is move on to item 4.8.2, which is the appointment of the vice chairs and hand back to Deborah as TFN lawyer. Deborah. Thank you, Chair. The first item is election of the majority vice chair. I could call for nominations for that. Are we moving Louise Gittens? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to nominate Louise. Happy to second Louise, if that's okay. Councillor Kidd, at all. Are there any other nominations? In which case, uh, if everybody's in favour, Councillor Gittins is re-elected. Agreed. Thank you. Chair, we need to move on to the election of the minority vice chair. Can we call for nominations? Chair, if there are no nominations for the minority vice chair, that item can be deferred to next meeting. 
I think that's an excellent suggestion, Deborah. So um, perhaps members from the um, Conservative uh, elected members could just confer between themselves uh, and let, let me know how they would wish to proceed. But as Deborah said, in formal terms, we'll deal with this at the next meeting. And this is not unprecedented. These are um, arrangements that, that need to be pursued. We have done this on a previous occasion. So we'll leave that um, Vice Chair um, open at the moment. I look forward to continuing to work with Louise Gittings as Majority Group Chair, Vice Chair, and I'll hand back to Deborah for the rest of this item. Thank you, Chair. The next item is the approval of the co-option of new LEP uh, members. Previously, LEP representatives have been co-opted individually. And as you'll recall, we changed the constitution last year to enable the uh, co-option to be general. So this uh, proposal is to co-opt all LEP representatives when they are notified to us without individual co-option. <laughs> Can I check if everybody's content with that? Seems to be a very sensible piece of housekeeping and it's very important we have the laps involved. Are colleagues content? So to do. Take silence for assent after a brief pause. Also getting some nods, Deborah, so I consider that approved. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The next item is to approve the membership of the committees of TFN as set out in the report. The membership is set out in the report and the only exception is that uh, Councillor Simon Blackburn is no longer a member of the board and therefore there will be a vacancy on the Audit and Governance Committee for which nominations will need to be uh, taken at the next meeting. So subject on vacancy, um, uh, do we have consent for Deborah's proposals on committee membership? Again, I'll have a brief pause in case anybody wishes to make a point. Uh, Chairman Andy Burnham has his, has his hand up. Thank and you. Councillor, Councillor Louise Gittings as well, please. I'll take Andy Burnham first. Welcome to the meeting, Andy, and then Louise Gittings. Thank you, Chair. Very briefly, uh, just to confirm my substitute member for the Rail North Committee uh, as Councillor Alan Brett, leader of Rochdale Borough Council. Thank you very much, Andy. That's excellent. And Louise? Yeah, it's just a query, really. Um, to, since we've been in lockdown, we've been having virtual meetings. Um, everybody, the members and the substitute members, get in, uh, invited, and they've all attended. And I just wondered, um, and this is purely selfish from our point of view, whether we need to have all of those as on the group for Rail North. Um, I, I, we've changed the sort of... the the, the constitution of Rail North, which is further on in the, the paper, and I just wondered if now is the time to review the membership. I'm, I'm not going to make a big thing about it, but it might just be um, worthwhile thinking about that. Okay, Deborah, I propose we take that offline, and you might want to have a word with Councillor Liam Robinson as chairman of that committee. Thank you, Chair. Yes. On the basis of the comments from... Uh, Louise Gittins and Andy Burnham, I'm taking on them board. Uh, I'm proposing, therefore, that we've agreed Deborah's committee membership proposals as circulated. So, Deborah, back to you for constitutional amendments. Uh, yes, Chair. The first one is to approve uh, the new procedural rules for virtual meetings. So, these have been circulated. They obviously make common sense. We've been adhering to them all day. Uh, I'll take silence for assent, but if anybody's not comfortable with the virtual rules, uh, let me know now. Thank you, Deborah. Um, the next proposal is amendments to the terms of reference of the Rail North Committee. Again, these are set out in the appendix to uh, the report. They've been referred to the Rail North Committee uh, where they were approved. So they did for approval. Yeah, silence for assent, as Deborah says, for the revised terms of reference, and this was largely to do with the excellent Blake Jones review and consequent for action. Uh, Chair, may Andy Burnham has his hand up again, please? Andy, please. Apologies, uh, Chair, again to come in. Uh, no, no disagreement with um, the proposal um, and the broadening of the scope uh, of, 
the committee, um, particularly talking infrastructure issues, but my team have asked uh, whether uh, we need to clarify that um, changes might also now need to be made to the partnership agreement between the Secretary of State for Transport and TFN, given the broadened role of this committee. So do we have to sort of address that to mirror the change, the terms of reference that we're suggesting here, possibly also the franchise management agreement, although that, that's less clear to me at that point. I think this is important, John, just very briefly, if I may, because it does touch on the point you were saying at the beginning about the relationship between TFN, the department, and the Northern Transport Acceleration uh, Council, because I think it's very important in that partnership agreement. It, it, it sets out a clear role for this board of TFN uh, to take a view on infrastructure prioritisation and then to be able to feed that in to any other body, be it the department or indeed this new uh, Northern, uh, Northern uh, Council. Uh, so I think this, you know, this is an important issue and it's just maybe it can't all be resolved, in a, but it, we need to log the fact that the partnership agreement, I think, needs to enshrine these new arrangements uh, when they're finally agreed. Sorry to uh, detain the board. Not a very, very helpful and very, very valid point. Uh, and as you know, um, we, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the meeting, we, we did agree precisely that this morning at the partnership board that we needed to find the right ways of having a very effective partnership with the evolving structures and the central government department. Um, so I, I'm proposing, therefore, that we agree the terms of reference rail change for, change for the rail committee, but pick up and take action on Andy Burnham's point about the partnership agreement. And that can be taken forward, Andy, in the conversations we were planning to have with the department as a result of last Thursday's announcements. Specifically picked up. Okay, back to Deborah then for um, minor amendments to the uh, constitution going forward. Thank you, Chair. There are further amendments in the uh, appendix to the report. Um, obviously, there are pen uh, amendments to the um, membership of the partnership board following the decision that members made earlier this year. And those are now effective in the Constitution. There's a proposal to allow the monitoring officer to make minor amendments of an administrative nature that don't affect um, the meaning of the Constitution and um, some other amendments to pick up um, pieces of legislation that weren't currently in there. Thank you. Darren, Darren Hale, I think, wishes to make a point. I just wanted to make a more general point, Mr Chair, and for review from yourself. Um, Unfortunately, it would appear that the humble authorities are heading for uh, divorce, uh, with some wishing to go towards Lincolnshire, and uh, the North Bank authorities wishing to remain uh, co-joined co or, or certainly working. At what point do we, will we decide? Uh, is it at the AGM where those changes are? Because we are mindful that neither of the North of the humble authorities are represented on the North Rail Committee, which is de which is decided by a. Um, it seems that it's once you're there, you're there, and there has to be a mechanism for us to revisit some of these issues. And I'm sure it isn't just us where the the wider issue of devolution is occurring. So would that um, would there be a paper or proposal brought forward to this body as to how we would look at how we respond to those devolution changes? Yes, indeed, Darren. Uh, we have precedent for this most recently, of course, in my part of the world with the uh, creation of a North of Tyne combined authority, but with um, the Transport Authority owing allegiance to two authorities now, given that South of the Tyne has different arrangements. Uh, so we, we have precedent for making these arrangements. We do it in consultation, obviously, with the affected members and then bring a proposal back. So we'll, we'll do that in due course as you wish us to do it. Sorry, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this, these are minor constitutional amendments then as read, unless anybody has approved, unless anybody has a particular point. Thank you. And then finally, Deborah, the organisation's whistleblowing policy, an important matter. Yes, thank you, Chair. We carried out a, a full review of the whistleblowing policy during the year, um, took on board best practice from elsewhere and revised it to make sure that it fully reflects um, the current legislation. We also have um, consulted uh, the trade unions 
and made amendments to reflect their comments. Um, it has been reviewed by the officers of the constituent authorities, and therefore we recommend it for approval. Do we approve the whistleblowing policy? Speak now, or it's agreed. Thank uh, you. Chair, Chair, oh. sorry, Chairman, we do have one comment. Uh, Judith Blake wants, wants to come in. We added the calendar of the meetings. It's Judith. Uh, sorry, apologies. I, I tried to make it clear I want to talk about the calendar of meetings, not the whistleblowing policy. No, that's right. You're, you're very welcome, Judith, to talk about okay. that. Um, if you remember, um, we've had a very unfortunate clash with the TFM meetings, with the LGA main meetings. Um, so it's the forum and the executive. And so I, I, I don't think we managed to resolve it, but it means that um, um, we have to sort of schedule apologies so that both are covered by Northern leaders. Um, so please could we um, communicate with the LGA and make sure we avoid that clash because it's very unfortunate if part, as we discussed earlier, if part of the region is never able to be properly represented, it's not it's not very good it's not a good thing and it's a completely unavoidable um, sort of set of circumstances really. But I think we've got an opportunity to get it right now. So so a very welcome point. Thank you for making it. And I do recall you making the point before. And um, we'll do our level best. And it is amazing how hard finding the right time and dates for meetings is, because not only is there the risk of clashing with other national organisations, there's also a heck of a challenge avoiding cabinet meetings of various local authorities across the north. So all I can say is we'll take it offline, Judith, and do our very, very best. I know that the team is already trying to vary this in order to maximise attendance of members, and your point is a very, very valid and essential part of getting that mix right. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. The uh, calendar of meetings will actually be brought to the next meeting for approval. Yeah, so that is very helpful. We can pick up um, Judith's point. Thank you very much. Does that complete your work, Deborah? Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, to Julie, for what you've done. Uh, David okay. Hogarth has his hand. Has his hand. Would you like to make a point, please, Chairman? Okay, David. Sorry, Chairman, that was a hand in error. Okay, no worries. Okay, I'm now going to move to item five on the agenda then, which is the budget revision one, first phase of the year. Um, important that we handle the budget properly, but also that we are handling it swiftly because we're already a little bit behind schedule. So, Ian Craven, as briefly as possible, please. Do I have Ian Craven? You do, but you had, you had a muted Ian Craven, sorry, John. No worries, we've all done it, Ian. Thank you for um, my case. Um, Overall, we've got an underspend for the first three months of the year of, of around £2 million. Um, that's mainly in the IST programme, um, and particularly in phase one of the IST programme. I think what we, we're, what we have seen are some direct impacts of COVID-19 on, on our activity levels now. I think the good news on that is that, that it should be possible to, to, to make up some of those um, phase one underspends over the, over the course of the rest of the year as, as, as activity gets going again. Um, for the full year, there is a, a reduction in the overall budget, including project programme contingencies of about a million and a half pounds. Um, but the actual committee's expenditure has increased. Um, that's that's the result of a, of a transfer from um, NPR contingencies into NPR committed of about four million pounds, um, and that, but, but offset by some some real reductions in expenditure both in the, in the NPR programme and elsewhere. Um, there is a, a a, a detailed or a more detailed explanation of, of, of the various movements in the budget lines in, in Table 2.8 in the report. Um, I, I, I'll stop there. I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious that people may have questions, so um, I'll, I'm happy to take questions from there. So thank you, Ian, for doing that so succinctly. This is an important matter, and uh, we welcome the fact you give it such close scrutiny as Finance Director. Are there any questions on the budget? Can I raise something? Yeah. Yes, Judith, please. Uh, 
Yeah, just we had um, a very, uh, we'll refer to it later, but we had a very good discussion with Chris Heaton Harris and made the point about resources for the implementation of the Blake Jones review. I'm not sure if we've got a specific line in the budget, but I, I think we should pick it up with officials and um, you guys supportive. So um, if we could take that away and make sure that that's adequately addressed. Yeah, well, that's, that's something we can, I can pick up with, with David Hogarth. That's something we've gone back to the department on a, a number of times, and Judith, so we, we can pick that up. Right, okay, thank you. James, is it James Lyon? Is anybody else waiting? Uh, there are no further comments or hands raised, Chair. Thank you, James. If not, then I put the budget for a sure. James Allen couldn't see my hand, but I had a comment, please. Oh, hey. Yeah, Graham uh, Miller. Thank you, James. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It was just asked to make the point that where we've had the integrated and smart travels programme delayed by COVID-19, like it's delayed everything else for several months, the North East Region had proposed the contactless payment system through Metro for our Phase 4 programme, the local smart screens, and it was just to ask Ian if we could get to working quickly with the DFT to unlock the business case appraisal on that, because it would be a quick win for us, Chair, for TFN. And that was my question to Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. Ian, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah. Um, the, the, my understanding is that the, the business case um, has been on the agenda for IPDC I think twice now, um, that has not actually been discussed by the committee and has not been approved at this stage by the committee. Um, so there may be somebody from the IST team on the call may have a, have a, a, a more recent update, but my, certainly my understanding is that we are still waiting for departmental approvals um, for that particular um, business case. So what I'm going to do is ask um, the IST team to come back to you directly, Graham, on that issue to give you the answer you need. I appreciate that, Chair. Sure. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. So if IST could follow that up, that would be really helpful. I'm now putting the Budget Revision 1 to the Board for approval. Thank you. The Budget is approved. Um, next point, then, is the Corporate Risk Register. Again, I'm going to ask Ian to very briefly introduce it. It's another hugely important matter, but it has been very thoroughly addressed by the Audit and this Committee. And I think, Ian, what we will not do is repeat the discussion that we had at the Partnership Board about more recent announcements. We'll take the paper as it was written for the Board. OK. Um, it probably is worth it. We, we... Carry on, Ian. Yeah. Um... Probably is worth just running through the process is, is, is quite important here in terms of the in, in terms of the risk register. Um, it was previously discussed by the board in, in September 2019. Um, as John said, it's a, a standing item on the audit and governance committee agenda, and as, as members will be aware, um, that um, audit and governance committee includes uh, members who sit on this board. Um, they approved it for submission to the committee on July the 16th. Now. There have been a couple of changes since then that obviously that board hasn't had a chance to look at, and I'll, I will pick up those up and just point those out to members when we when we get to that point. Um, the one thing you'll notice is the format of the report has changed slightly since the last time we we um, we considered it. Um, that has been based on um, recommendations from the audit committee um, with the intention of making it more user friendly. So hopefully that is the case. But if anybody's got any further comments, then, then we'd be happy to take those on board. Um, the key changes that I think I just draw your attention to in terms of, of changes from the previous presentation, I think the first is there are a number of new risks that, that people will recognise. So um, COVID-19 obviously has been, has been added. There have been changes to the ICT programme to reflect the cancellation of, of the original phase three and the risks and new risks associated with the, with the change in approach. Um, and members will also note that there is now a, a decarbonisation risk, which reflects a, a discussion previously by this board. Um, there's also been a significant change to the nature and the extent of the rail operations risks, which is, which is probably the area that's been most significantly impacted by COVID-19. Um, and finally, and this is this is the, the, the piece that we've not had a chance to discuss with the audit committee, the level of risk associated with 
TFN reputation and political engagement and the risk associated with TFN operations has been increased to reflect the uncertainty following the recent announcements that were discussed earlier. Um, obviously, they were made subsequent to the audit committee and therefore have not been discussed in that in that forum. Um, there's probably just a few few final points I'd draw your attention to um, before before we go into a discussion. And um, the first is that I think it's people will recognise that the overall risk profile of TFM has undoubtedly increased over the last six months. Um, that is partly due to, to COVID-19, but, but due to, to other issues as well. Um, TFN's ability to control certain of those risks is limited. Um, this is reflected in the number of mitigation actions that are flagged as limited control, um, but it, it also comes to in certain risk areas where post-mitigation impacts are not significantly reduced, um, showing, you know, demonstrating that, that, that we can't sometimes significantly influence um, the impact the risks are having. Um, COVID-19 is clearly a significant ongoing risk and will be for some time. Um, in, in relation to COVID-19, whilst we generally avoid naming the Chief Executive as a, as a mitigation risk owner, the Audit and Governance Committee was, was quite clear that it wanted a single officer to be identified for, um, as the responsible um, for managing COVID-19 risks. Um, and this just makes explicit that the, the Chief Executive's role in that, that risk management around COVID-19 and um, it's, it's possibly implicit um, across the other risk areas. Um, and finally, I think as, as John, John has mentioned, we, we discussed probably the most significant, significant risk that, in case that we have seen in, in terms of TFN's areas of, of responsibility is around rail operations, uh, and in particular the long-term impact of COVID-19. Um, that has been discussed at Audit and Governance Committee and um, the North Committee and also by this board previously. Um, and, and, and there is particularly fo particular focus I know within the strategic rail team about the recovery of passenger demand on the railway. Um, that was really a quick, okay. quick down through. Um, so I'm happy to we'll welcome, welcome the discussion on the, on, on the paper. So I'm conscious of three hands up already, so I'm going to take in this order Andy Burnham, Peter Cannon and Louise Gittins. Andy? Thanks, uh, Chair. And I, I don't have a comment uh, on the register itself so much as uh, one of the groups that uh, monitors it and um, uh, updates it. And this is a, a risk assessment group, which I think is attended at officer level, uh, John. It, it's been put to me that this group has, hasn't met for over a year and possibly has been disbanded. I don't know if that is the case or not. The point I just want to make on this is um, I think this is a side of TFN's work that needs to sort of perhaps take higher profile. I don't want to revisit the conversation that I missed this morning that, that you had on the back of earlier announcements. But in, in the debate that, we, that has been taking place about TFN in the last uh, few weeks, I have fed in very strongly my view that TFN was the only organisation which brought some clarity to the mess that we uh, found ourselves in in May 2018. It was TFN that called for a troubleshooter uh, to be appointed, which I think with hindsight is a very good decision uh, by this board. I think we took in Sheffield at the, at the time, late 2018, um, and Richard George did, has done and continues to do a tremendous job, in my view, in sorting out the chaos on railways in the north and also uh, made the very clear call for an operator of last resort, another change that I think has brought stability to the railways of the north. My point is that we are closer to the railways of the north and therefore much better placed than anybody to spot the risks to our services. And actually, as we move forward from this, we've got to be very vigilant, I think, in not allowing uh, chaos to re-enter uh, services as we sort of slowly build up out of, out of this crisis. So... My, my call, Chair, would be not only does this group reconvene, uh, but I think gets a much higher status within the organisation. You know, having a surveillance function over the railways in the north and having a, a strong risk assessment group uh, looking out for potential disruptions to service continuity, I think needs to be a core part of transport for the north and its, its unique remit over the railways in the north applying a level of surveillance and vigilance that the Department for Transport, quite frankly, is not in a position uh, to, to do, nor is a Northern Transport Acceleration Council, which is looking at uh, not operational matters, but more uh, new investments. So 
I just think, you know, this group needs to start meeting regularly, and I would, I would suggest it should take a higher status within the organization when it comes to overseeing the, uh, the, the revised risk register that Ian has presented. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. What I'll do, Andy, is ask um, Barry White to come back to you directly on that particular group. It's not a group I am conscious of, so I don't want to speak about it. I will ask Barry to come back to you and talk to you, talk you through how those arrangements could be strengthened. But your point is very compelling and well made. Peter Kennan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm very reassured, as always, by the thoroughness of this document. It's, uh, it is very reassuring as a, as a member to see uh, this. In relation to COVID-19 risks, uh, I, I note the risks that have been put into here, uh, and they are great. I, I'm, I'm wondering from experience elsewhere, I'm seeing health and well-being of staff being included as well as a potential risk because of the danger of isolation and the loss of team work. And also, of course, IT security is an increased risk when everyone's working remotely. So I just wondered if uh, they could be taken away and we get some feedback on those at a future date. Peter will make sure that happens. Thank you very much. I think the point on wellness of staff and wellness of all partners during the COVID uh, crisis is a point very well made. Louise Gittins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really to build on the, the, the previous two uh, contributions, I think the idea of the officer group overseeing the risk register is, is a really good one um, because there's a lot of risks here, but even with the mitigations that we've put in place, there's still high risk. Um, and maybe if we've got um, a group overseeing it, that will actually start to bring some of the risks down because it is quite concerning to see red right across the board. Um, and there might be some other things that we could be doing to bring those risks down. Um, and that's, that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as I mentioned, I think that reinforces the need for Barry to come back with uh, uh, a proposal on how the arrangement works and how this works with the Audit and Risk Committee. So, I'm going to um, ask you to accept the uh, Corporate Risk Register today as an item approved with Andy, Louise and Pete's comments picked up. Thank you very much. Now, we are already running a little bit behind schedule, so we have a very important monthly operating report. This is a management tool document that you receive, so you have full visibility and assurance across our activities. Um, I'm not proposing that we take this item today. You have an opportunity to deal with it bilaterally. I will take any comments anybody wants to make now, but I think time would better probably most appropriately be spent moving on. So the monthly operating report, does anybody wish to comment? There are no comments or right hands, Jim. James, thank you very much. This is in no way devaluing the very important work that goes into the preparation of this report, so please pursue it bilaterally if you need to. It's mainly a statement for record. So I'm now going to move on to item eight, which is the Transpennine route upgrade. As we know, we had a very important announcement last Thursday at Manchester Piccadilly by the Secretary of State. I think Andy, uh, he joined you there, which is excellent. And um, we're now going to receive an update from Russ McMillan, who is the DFT's director for this very important project. So I'm handing over to Russ McMillan, please. Thank you, Chair. So um, I had provided some slides. I wasn't clear whether you were going to share them or whether I would just talk to them. Um, if I just uh, start by speaking and if they don't come up on the screen. In the interest of time, oh, sorry, I was going to say in the interest of time, I'm far keener to hear from you than go through a slide pack, if that's possible. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was going to structure um, a discussion on three parts. The first was just to remind you of the context of the route. Uh, the second was just to talk you through um, the programme as it is, exists today. And then the third was to land on the investment decision that was made uh, recently and announced last week. In terms of the context of the route, I think you'll all be well aware, so I won't dwell on it, but it's the main York Leeds uh, Manchester route by Huddersfield. Um, it hasn't been significantly upgraded since the 1970s, very so significant overcrowding and poor reliability, which is predominantly driven by the fact that it's a two-track railway with quite a mix of fast, slow and freight traffic. 
the scheme itself is very much focused on uh, reliability and capacity, and in that sense, it's very much focused on improving the, uh, the experience for passengers of today. Uh, one of the benefits of that is that it does mean that it's relatively immune to COVID demand scenarios, and actually, in this case, is quite robust uh, to different COVID demand scenarios in the future, which I think is helpful given the current context. And it's a scheme that has quite significant implications beyond the actual line of the route. So uh, one of the challenges on this particular bit of railway is it, is it allows contagion of delays to spread east to west. And so what the scheme provides through a significant um, section of multi-track in the middle is a bit of a fire break that isolates performance issues in the east and the west of the country. If we move on and talk to uh, just what the scheme is trying to do, um, there's effectively uh, a confirmed programme, which is the programme that was announced last week, and that would be the programme that you recognise and you've heard about before. A uh, very significant performance improvement expected through those infrastructure upgrades. Uh, it moves the uh, capacity of the line from six trains an hour to eight trains an hour, and it doubles that significant uh, congested section of the route in the middle uh, to, 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 to deliver some significant performance and capacity improvements in that area. On journey times, uh, there's some uh, modest improvements, taking about six minutes off the Leeds to Manchester journey uh, and about uh, seven or eight minutes off the York to Manchester journey. And on accessibility, we would expect about another 25% of the stations on the route to move to a fully uh, step-free position. On electrification, uh, we've got a strategic uh, or a partially electrified uh, option on the table at the moment that effectively electrifies the key sections of the route that would enable some local services to go electric and some of the bi-mode services to run in electric mode through these sections of the route. So that's the confirmed programme, the £3 to £4 billion pound programme that you've heard about uh, much before. What, what's significantly changed is there's a significantly longer list of options that are now being developed beyond that confirmed programme that we brought back to future investment decisions next year. And that would actually take uh, a partially electrified scheme uh, and look at the feasibility of fully electrifying the scheme. It would examine the opportunity to take another couple of minutes off the journey time, which takes you about as good as you'll get on that route. If you think about some of the northern powerhouse options that would go much quicker down to 30 minutes, that's predominantly through brand new lines and sort of new high-speed alignments. Uh, the extra couple of minutes you might achieve on TLU uh, is probably about as much as you could achieve given the route alignment and some of the topography issues. It will look at digital signalling and it will look at further sections of three and four tracking along the route. Just to emphasise, these are very significant options uh, that are in the sort of two, three billion pound category, and clearly they are options that are going to have to be worked up over a period of time and be brought, brought back to an investment decision. But are very much part of uh, the programme of development as it as it uh, exists today. So what does the investment announcement mean that we made last week? So as you'll have heard, uh, the Secretary of State announced £589 million into the scheme. That allows us to do two things. So um, what we're keen to do is to balance the need for ambition with the need for speed. And the need for speed drives us to uh, get on with effectively uh, some of the aspects of the scheme where there's some stability. So uh, for all of the aspects of the scheme where we already have a fully electrified solution, where we already have the maximum capacity benefits, we will be moving those immediately into uh, the next phase of the design process and we'll be beginning some early enabling construction works. And that allows the first benefits from the scheme to be delivered as early as 2024. In parallel to that, it then also funds uh, the significant design and development work required to develop those additional options that I spoke about a, a moment ago. Um, and that allows us to make those final scope choices um, early next year and, and confirm the scope of the scheme and effectively get on with it and deliver it in the 2020s. So that's a bit of a quick run through. I, I will pause at that point because I'm conscious that there will probably be quite a lot of questions and I'm happy to pick up any of those points uh, as people wish. Thank you, Russ. That was uh, very nicely done and thank you for doing it. James, do we have anybody waiting? Uh, Andy Burnham and uh, Graham Miller, please, Jim. Okay, so um, maybe I'll just take Graham first just to ring the changes. Graham? Oh, cheer up. You're so kind. Thank you very much. 
Sorry, Andy. Ross, very, very pleased that my colleagues in the Leeds Manchester corridor are getting their necessary upgrade of 589 million. But as a North East Council, I am also in equal measure disappointed that yet again there is no mention referencing what the DFT is doing to bring funding forward for the East Coast Mainline, which is our critical rail corridor. And that uh, has been echoed by the North East Chamber of Commerce, and on and on it goes. Uh, when are we going to see the DFT actually commit to giving us what we need to start the investment in the North East that helps us with our economic and transport grades? Because yet again, we believe it's a missed opportunity. So thank you, Chair. Over to you, Russ. Okay, I'll take all the points that people want to raise and then give Russ McMillan the, the chance of right of reply. Andy Burnham, please. Just to throw a little solidarity in the way of Councillor Miller, I would certainly uh, want to support the call from the North East as, as well for, for progress. We want to see progress all over the North. But, uh, Russ, if I may just uh, make one observation on your uh, presentation, which was very good. Um, of course, some of the, um, the things that are being talked about now, full freight compatibility, uh, electric, full electrification, are things that this board has called for. Uh, over a period of time, so it is good uh, to see movement in that direction, although I appreciate what you say, that there's still work, uh, work to be done and decisions to be taken. I guess the, the point I just wanted to kind of pick up on was your thing about speed versus ambition. Now, this is, a, this is an issue that this board is always sort of being confronted with, and I think if you gave us the choice, we would normally go for ambition uh, over, over speed, recognising that both are important. We still want the right solution for the north of England for the rest of this of this century. So I suppose my question is, we, maybe not today, but at some point, can we have clarity over how the Northern Transport Acceleration Council, if it is to be that body, will make that decision, you know, how it will make that decision, giving weight to this board's view as opposed to the department's uh, view? And if actually we have to sort of reprioritise other schemes to, to get the, the full ambition into this one, I think many of us would be prepared to, to, to do that. Um, so I, I think this scheme is moving in the right direction finally. You know, to pick up the point from um, Darren, who I think has got his hand up, uh, and I'm sure Steve Robin will make this point, you know, freight compatibility between our two great ports, Liverpool and Hull, uh, taking lots of freight traffic off the M62 uh, is, a, is a real objective for the north of England, and, you know, we, we want to see that happen. So I guess, you know, the question is, if we're going to be forced to choose with speed versus ambition, what role will this board have in that decision, uh, given that I think most of us would tend towards more of the ambition rather than the speed uh, side of things? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to bring Darren Hale in and then Judith Blake. Darren? Just, uh, just to reiterate the points that have been made by my two colleagues a minute ago, I, I think there is a danger that this becomes a sort of twin track north and um, it's got to be the transport for the north and not just transport for parts of the north. And I think that whilst those areas you've alluded to definitely need that overhaul, as I've said earlier in the meeting, the, the easy, quick wins would be the bits that don't involve any land grab and would be relatively easily achieved, which would be both the whole to Selby electrification, but equally the bits um, near Liverpool. Um, and when it comes to freight, we can only have we can't have half a freight route. We either have a freight route or we don't have a freight route. And um, and I, I think that's mitigated against by having sections that are in a sense, on the non-electrified section. Now, I know we can use hybrid trains, but I think that, obviously, it's no substitute for full electrification, but you would expect me to say that, I know. Um, but I, I just want to bang that drum again, which I continue to do at Transport for the North, and say, please do not forget Liverpool, please do not forget, obviously, my city of Hull. Thank you, Darren. Truly coast to coast, of course. Um, and Judith. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll start with the comments I was going to make at the end of my contribution and um, just to support colleagues from other areas to say actually I think leaders right across the north need to be, we need to make sure that they're engaged in the discussions around this all every step of the way and obviously in West Yorkshire there are implications for the Calder Valley and for Huddersfield, Kirklees um, going forward so I think that, you know, it's really important that we make sure that everybody is kept on the um, same page. But having said all this, um, 
you know, this, the, the upgrade to Transpennine is one of those issues that has dogged the North for a long time, and it is, it, it is really a totemic issue now in terms of um, real commitment and um, one that we need to make sure um, we see through it. It's been um, delayed and set back and um, disappointed us for, for too long now. Um, a couple of um, questions, really. Um, if we're talking about full electrification, can we please have a better understanding of the technology around this, how we're going to avoid all of the, um, the issues that were put to us as arguments against for electrification in terms of the having to ride in the tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. Have we now got better technology that means we can avoid some of that massive um, disruption that would need to come in? Um, but I would have expected to see, if I'm honest, more focus on the passengers, given all the work we've done over the last couple of years. Um, so there's going to, we know there's going to be, you know, once we start to see levels of passenger numbers coming back up, that there is going to be major disruption as a result of this work. I think running alongside this, there needs to be a proper, a really good communication plan in terms of how we're making sure that um, the, um, the travelling public um, are catered for as this welcome work continues. Um, but I don't think um, we're really yet picking up the opportunity around making sure that all of the stations along the route become upgraded so they're fully accessible. And one of our major objectives is to be a fully inclusive um, transport network. So don't let's miss this opportunity. I think we're, you know, there are too many people who cannot travel by train because they physically aren't able to do so. And the stations along this route are, um, um, really do fit into that category. So it's an a real opportunity for us to address an issue that has been a real problem for us for some time. Thank you very much, Judith. James, could you just confirm that we've picked up everybody who wanted to speak? Uh, Councillor Michael Green, and uh, that seems to be the last. Mm -hmm. I'll take Michael then, and then I'll go back to Russ McMillan for a brief sweep. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman. I, I obviously improve, uh, obviously support the um, upgrade to the Trans Pennine route um, and, and the government funding announcements. But it's also worth noting that we also have an east to west railway line a little further north, which links East Lancashire into Yorkshire. Uh, and that's a railway line that's suffered from a lack of investment over the years as well. And that investment is required in order to support regeneration in East Lancashire and ensure the significant benefits of our counties. The county can, can make that contribution to the regional and UK economy to, to its full extent. Uh, so that, that, that's one that we need to keep on the agenda and keep pushing for as well, Chair. Um, thank, thank you. you very much, Michael. So, Russ, if I could ask you to take detailed comments bilaterally. There were some questions there that perhaps need a, a bilateral answer. And just give a summative uh, response, please. So if I just cover a couple of the key points, so um, on, um, on the speed versus the amb amb ambition point, um, absolutely our aim is to achieve both, and the primary uh, speed driver is the degree of disruption that would be tolerable, which I think uh, links to Councillor Blake's point. Um, the, 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 uh, the Northern Transport Acceleration Council will absolutely be overseeing the scheme. I think Secretary of State made clear that his ambition for that council is to give some impetus to these projects and, and speed them up. On a couple of the specific scope points, so freight, we absolutely understand the need to take a regional view. In parallel to the work going on under Trans Pennine, there is a, a, a cross-regional uh, piece of activity being kicked off to look at those regional east-west routes into which the TLU activity will be docked. Uh, but we do have some ambition in TLU uh, to, to deliver some quite significant changes on freight. Um, on the broader regional uh, activity and uh, effectively implications beyond the line of the TIU route, I think all of the projects mentioned uh, have, have, have got specific work underway and are progressing. I think it's important to emphasise that TIU itself uh, does provide significant performance benefit far beyond uh, the line of the route. And I think it's also worth emphasising that under the TIU umbrella, we're investing quite significantly in some of the diversionary routes that will be used during construction, which has uh, quite significant leg legacy benefit. Excuse me. And on the disruption and the communications plan, we absolutely agree. Uh, we're clearly moving into that phase where we're going to start uh, construction.
Scottish and then that to start from will kick off. We'll be giving to get some stability in what that access plan and, and what access we require for the railway looks like and then communications plan can then fall out of that. I appreciate that I probably haven't addressed every point, but hopefully that was just a brief skim over some of the main points and uh, very much very happy to engage bilaterally on anything that we haven't managed to cover in this meeting. Okay, that's for that. So, so, uh, the accessible stations issue is a really important one that we've raised at this board numerous times. Yeah, that, yeah absolutely. And to be clear, um, we are uh, developing options to make all stations on the route step free. Per the other options we're developing, we will need to develop designs, look at the cost, and then consider the investment decision. But we are absolutely including within the scope of the design thinking what it would take to make all stations on the route step free. Even the confirmed scope of the programme today would take us to about 75 percent. We clearly want to go further than that, which is why we're developing those additional options. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Russ, and good luck with the project. Um, Thank you. Item 9, Rail North Committee feedback. David, is there anything from the Rail North Committee meeting on the 14th, David Hogarth, that is, 14th of July, that we need to be aware of at this board? Just a, a couple of things, uh, Chair, very briefly, if I, if I can. Um, the operational update, uh, the introduction of the July timetable have gone, uh, uh, have gone very well. As we've heard elsewhere, performance is still, is still very high from, uh, from both operators, something we haven't seen for, for some time. So the big emphasis on how that is retained and built upon as the timetable is built back towards a more normal uh, state of affairs. The key issue under discussion at the committee was around the, the low confidence that passengers uh, had in rail and they really heeded the message to stay away and it's, it's good to see that message has now changed so people are now able to use public transport obviously still asked to look at alternatives like cycling, cycling and walking where they can look at travelling off peak uh, but the messaging has changed from the operators which I think is a, is a positive step forward and uh, Really, the committee heard there's a really strong partnership now, uh, a resetting of the relationship with both operators and the industry network rail in general, which is something that TFN has helped facilitate through, uh, through the work we've done with weekly meetings, just come off a call this lunchtime with the industry, which is something that didn't happen before. So a really sort of positive uh, uh, platform to build on there. Clearly some challenges on, on costs and resources going forward, given that government is now... Uh, bailing out the train uh, uh, services and standing behind the, uh, uh, the low uh, usage at the moment and a, a real sentiment from committee members to make sure there's no backsliding on the investment that is needed and the services and the capacity that is needed to, uh, to build back a, a better railway which was uh, a key thing that was discussed at the meeting. So that was the operational bit. The other public bits were around uh, Blake Jones' uh, review implementation and, and the reform agenda, and I think uh, Councillor Blake is going to update on those, Chair. Thank you very much, David. Judith, did you want to say any more about your meeting with Chris Heaton Harris? Yes, that's a, that's a good opportunity to so we had um, we had that meeting as we agreed to. Um, so contact him, he's very pleased to, to meet with us. Um, and um, we did have a, a good discussion about the really the delay to, to Williams being published and where, where we are with that and um, very strong commitment from the Minister around um, further devolution and I think we need to make sure that we keep a very direct conversation with him. He would have liked to have come on the call today but um, he's covering for some urgent business I think for number 10 um, today, so if we could make sure that he's invited to the next meeting, um, I think we have a we have a long-standing um, commitment from that came from Chris Grayling originally that there would be a minister available to us on these meetings. So if we could make sure um, that um, that that um, happens, um, and um, so we're going to keep the conversation going around um, around devolution, particularly. Um, Accountability and, um, and transparency, and the whole work around um, putting the passenger um, at the heart of everything we did. Well, we had a good discussion about post-COVID as well. Although I'm afraid that is a bit of an ambitious statement because at the moment we are all of us learning to live with COVID. I think that's we have to be absolutely um, 
honest about that. Um, but you, you know, we raised the issue of the Northern Transport Charter as well. Um, so that was um, received with interest. So lots of areas to cover. Um, I think as a result of um, that, and we put out we put out a, a jointly agreed statement that I think was circulated to all board members late last night or this morning. David, is that is that right? I think it's it's gone around the board board members. It went round last night, to Councillor Pike. Yes. I think you know if the members read that, there is still a lot of common ground and a lot of um, areas to help us move forward, but. We didn't get any um, sense of what is going to happen to Williams, um, and I think that's something we need to watch with interest because, obviously, in terms of future governance, um, you know there are massive implications in um, all of that work. Obviously, the, crisis, the health crisis has probably caused some um, difficulties there around um, the, you know, the, just the 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 the, 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 con the state of franchising generally is um, is quite fragile, I'd say, but um, any clarity that we can get on that, I think, would be very gratefully received. Thank you for that, Judith. Just one comment, if I may. I mean, clearly, it, it is helpful if we have a minister at these meetings, and they are, they are always welcome. Um, just to reiterate the point I made earlier, September is the crunch meeting for NPR, so um, that has to dominate the agenda. Um, as against other items, and obviously a minister here would be fantastic for that, but um, I'll have to take a rain check on how much extra capacity there is on the agenda to do other items. Um, okay, so that's the Royal Committee feedback. Um, I think we should take that for note, unless there are any urgent comments from members. Uh, Phil Riley has a hand up, please, Chair. Okay, Phil Riley then, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just really picking up a point that uh, was made by David about um, about confidence on the railway. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a complicated process. But I and I was talking recently to somebody who who dipped a toe in the water, got a train, found themselves surrounded by a group of people who weren't wearing face masks, weren't social distancing, weren't doing all the stuff that they're supposed to do, and uh, and she's not going to. I mean, she'll not be doing that again, kind of thing. And I, I know it's hard, but it's a it's an absolutely intrinsic feature of how we get people back onto the railways. Is that, we lost you slightly there, Phil. Have you completed your point? I've completed my point about when I said intrinsic point. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And we've all had similar experiences, I think, on trains or in shops. Uh, it's quite a challenge rebuilding confidence. Yeah. But as Judith said earlier, absolutely, and, and Chris Brewer, obviously, a absolutely vital project. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we haven't lost you because yeah, no, 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 I, no, no, thanks. James, anybody else, or are we done on the Rail North Coast? Uh, Andy Murdoch has a hand up, please. Chairman. Andy, please, yes. Thank you, Chair. Briefly, it was to thank um, members of the committee and actually this board for the um, strong support that's been given um, over the position of central Manchester capacity and the, and the solution uh, that will be eventually found. I know I raise this a lot, but it does obviously affect every single colleague on this on this call, and your support has been uh, much appreciated. I just wanted to say that there was an announcement made last week, um, which, as I understood it, could have been very different, in that there would appear to be a wish within Network Rail to take platforms 15 and 16 completely off the agenda, and, uh, and move forward on a different basis. That might be where we get to in the end. I, I, I don't know. But I think it's very important that that isn't assumed um, before we have a viable alternative in place. And the steadfast position of this board in supporting the Greater Manchester position is extremely appreciated, number one. But I think number two goes back to this point about getting the governance of the railways of the North right, because if this board isn't making those clear positions, I think we may find ourselves in the future just having to get what we're given, and I don't think that's the place where we want to be, given all the progress we've made on devolution uh, in the North. So I just wanted to sort of use this opportunity to thank the Board for the strong support they've given to our position. We, we didn't see an announcement, which I think could have been made last week, that 15 or 16 were gone. We are way too early to make that judgment uh, until we see an alternative scheme properly worked out. But I just wanted to use this again to re-emphasise the importance of this board 
in steadfastly sticking to what is right for the north of England. And this is another example of it. And I'm grateful to colleagues for their support. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think we know that parts of the rail industry believe they've came, come up with an even more effective proposal, to which our answer is, please present it to us with all the appropriate evidence, and we'll look at it uh, and come to a judgment. And we would wish to be helpful, but we have to see what's being proposed and why it's better. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you very much. I'm therefore going to move to item 10, the investment programme update. Now, you may well have felt when you read this paper that it was Groundhog Day because you'd seen this paper before, and if that's what you thought, you were absolutely right. This, of course, was discussed in the private section of the last meeting in June, and I make no apology to members of the public or the press. It was entirely appropriate that there was a second reading debate of this paper when it was being drafted and was in an embryonic state. Um, members broadly endorsed this in June. There were some comments made about improvements, particularly by your good self, Andy, and I think those improvements have been incorporated. So this paper now is coming for endorsement by the board rather than um, uh, discussion by the board because we discussed it in private at the June meeting, but we need to formally agree it in a public meeting. So I hope you feel you've got the changes you were looking for. I will throw it open for comment. There's nods there from Andy. I'll take Keith Little and then uh, see where we get to. Keith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I agree it was discussed at some length at the last board meeting. Can I just say that there are a number of projects, uh, particularly in around my neck of the woods, that don't appear on this um, list anymore. We've had some assurances over the last 24 hours that this is not a, an indicative list, that they can still be changed, uh, and we will look for some of those to be added. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hold our in just for a moment. I'm after members at the moment. So, other members who want to contribute? James, do we have any other members? Michael Green, I think, wants to come in. Uh, Judith Blake as well, please. Uh, take Michael first, please. Thanks, Jim. Sorry, I didn't indicate for this item. Oh, sorry. Thank you very okay. much. And Judith, were you for this item as well, please? I just made a comment on that bar, which I'd like you to take account of it for the previous item. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no, no, yeah, please. Yeah, th thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. I, mean, I very much welcome the report and the investment programme. I'm obviously particularly pleased to see the inclusion of the Doncaster Sheffield um, rail link uh, at the airport. Uh, I'm mindful that we're looking to endorse the report, but I did just want to um, reflect on the work that we've been doing. We've quickly progressed an SOBC for a major road scheme at the villages of Hickleton and Mar. Um, these are two villages that have absolutely been crippled by congestion in recent years. This is linked to the work which TFN have been doing on the northern route as part of the southern Pennines Corridor programme. So at some point we are going to be looking to try and find a way in which we can include this SOBC, but this may not be the right moment for it now, but I did just want to raise the concerns we have about the impact that congestion is having on the villages of Hickleton and Moor, and we're keen to work with you in the future to try and find a solution to that particular challenge. Thank you, Dan. We'll pick that one up. Any other members? Are we done, James? No, there are no further comments or raised hands, Chair. So, Owen, were you seeking to just wrap this up? Just very quickly, just to kind of clarify with Councillor Little, it's the economic recovery plan, and I think you were referring to. Um, rather than this report, and I appreciate that the, 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 they've got some yeah, stuff. Um, but I've got a call with uh, officers from Cumbria later today to discuss the uh, list of the economic recovery plan. Excellent. Thank you. Right. On that basis, then, can we endorse this proposal? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so moving then to item 11, which is the economic recovery plan. We saw, again, an earlier draft of this, but a great deal of work has been done between meetings. What we are proposing now is that we have your endorsement to be able to submit this to the Secretary of State 
in order that while he's working on economic recovery, he has the benefit of our best ideas. Um, conscious of time, but is there anything, Pete or Owen, that you need to say on this item, or are you just mainly seeking endorsement? Well, if, if, if I may, Chair, just uh, two minutes, just to say thank you to all the officers that have contributed to the, the work. It's been, been very fast-paced. We put together around 70% of the investment by cost it is taken from schemes that are in our investment, but the remainder of schemes is very much focused on station accessibility, which Councillor Blake mentioned. Um, the, the next scheme, contactless ticketing, is nested within TFN's work on contactless, so that, that is picked up within our proposals. We're also looking at how we can bring forward critical maintenance schemes. Um, flexible ticketing on trains and active travel is also an important part of the proposal uh, uh, and you know, clearly there have been recent announcements on that as well. So, so this is about um, also um, making sure our partners can take forward delivery of schemes um, which they will be responsible for a, very much on the local networks uh, and calling for that sort of sustained investment in, in local travel improvements as well as the more strategic um, infrastructure upgrades. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments from members, please? Seen this before in an earlier draft, and your officers have obviously contributed very extensively. Sure. Dan Jarvis? Sorry, I think. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dan Jarvis and uh, Councillor Graham Miller, please, Chairman. Graham Miller first, then. Graham Miller and then Dan Jarvis. Thank you very much, Chair. It's just the, the, the report on the sale in Dorset, but the A693 Stanley Bypass Scheme, there wasn't included, uh, apparently due to insufficient information. Now, this is... This is for my Durham colleagues who are part of North East Combined Authority. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a concern about that, and we do ask that this is revisited as the scheme was advanced, and it can be delivered if the funding was available within 24 months and has excellent regeneration uh, credentials and wider economic benefits for Durham, but specifically for Stanley in that part of the, the North East Combined Authority. So I wanted to, to get that noted, Chair, and that was the point of raising it. Thank you very much. The point's to pick, we'll pick it up and come back to you, Graham. Dan Jarvis. Thank you, Chair. Happy to endorse the report. I just wanted very quickly to, to make two connected points. The first is around devolution, and I think recent events have demonstrated what we already knew, um, the, the, the real importance that we attach to devolving funding when it comes to transport matters. The other relates to the importance of light rail, and I just slightly worry that light rail has become the poor relation in recent months. Um, there isn't a reference in the Economic Recovery Plan to the renewal of Supertram. Clearly that's a very significant project for us in South Yorkshire, and I think that we should continue to look for opportunities to reinforce the value of light rail systems. We've had some particular challenges in terms of getting the funding that we need uh, from government to keep our light rail systems running. And I think we've got an important role to play in terms of artic articulating the importance uh, to our communities. So those were just two points I wanted to land, Chair. Thank you, hugely important. James, any other hands up? Uh, Councillor Michael Green, please, Chair. Michael. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very happy to, to support this report, which is very well drafted and covers, covers a lot of the key points for, for us right across the, the north of England. But in, in particular, looking at the Lancashire, I'm, I'm pleased to see some, some particular schemes have been in, included, particularly active travel corridors in the Preston City region, uh, funding for the M55 to Hales, St. Anne's, Link Road, and a number of rail improvements, for instance, Cliff Road to Elifield, which is over in the Ribble Valley, for those who don't know locally. Uh, the reopening of mid Railway Station, uh, capacity announcements on the South Fowl Line and the Scalmersdale Rail Link and Town Centre Stations, which are all key projects. We don't have time to go into to them in detail, but all, all would make significant improvements, A, for the quality of life for local residents, but B, to, to further boost the economy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, time is against us, but I am conscious that we haven't had perhaps as much contribution from LEP colleagues in, in the last short while, and this is an economic recovery plan. So um, I don't require an answer, but 
I'm just throwing the floor open to any of our LEP colleagues if they wish to comment on whether they think this will help entrepreneurs and business investors in the north of England with economic recovery. Anything from the LEPs? So I think Peter Cannon. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to say that we have been extensively involved um, in this through officers locally and feeding things in. So um, we can endorse um, Sheffield City Region, everything that's in here. Thank you very much. That's appreciated. OK, I'm putting this paper to the board for endorsement then, and we will submit it to the Secretary of State. Um, I'll take silence for a cent. Thank you very much, colleagues. We're now moving to item 12, which is the Northern Transport Charter. Uh, there was a, a meeting of the member working group chaired by Councillor Blake last Friday, hence the slightly later than normal report, which is very welcome to have. And um, I'm just going to ask Judith to comment on this. Judith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, the, the, the meeting just chucked me out for the last um, 10 minutes. I've literally just come back. Go on. I, think I, it was, uh, I don't know quite what, what um, happened there, but um, yes, we've, uh, we had a good, um, a good discussion, so quite a lot of work to, um, to get on with. I think there's, been, um, there's quite a lot of discussion about the, um, the Northern Transport Investment Committee, um, <coughs> and we're very much at pains to make sure that um, it would be um, it wouldn't be a decision making um, body, but we just need to make sure um, that that is absolutely clarified, so that there's no sense that it's um, a body acting within um, within a, um, a body. Um, so I think the, the most important thing is that we've um, we've got the the work. I think where we where we want it to move forward. Um, could, would it be possible to ask that we um, officers provide us with a communication plan so that we can start to um, publicise the work that we're doing and um, make sure that we're, we're all on the same page? Yes, um, very sensible. Obviously, um, lots of um, discussion about the, um, the Northern Budget and Infrastructure Pipeline, um, all of these things that are really, you know, we've, we really want to really get on the front page and move forward at um, a pace and make sure that the board is fully aware of um, all of the, the matters that we need to take forward. Thank you, Judith. Um, any, this was primarily to update you on what the working group had been doing. Um, any comments? Yeah, Andrew Washington has uh, just placed a comment to say that he's endorsed it and it's thanks for the process. Excellent, thank you. Uh, currently, there are no other comments or raised hands. Okay. Thank you then for that very valuable work, Judith. So, is that a, is that agreed then? As I read the report, the next outcome of this will be um, a paper to submit to the spending review submission. Okay. Let me make sure that we've got the all of the the cons around it so that we can move forward. Yeah, John, um, David Hughes here, yeah, we're happy to sort of take that on and work with the members working group around the cons, but uh, as, you, as you say, Chair, the, um, the, the, the next step would be to finalise this as a report for sign-off at the September board, uh, which we would then envisage um, forming a key part of a, of a spending review submission. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, item 13 then, um, this is to propose that we end the public meeting in order to do one short item in private. For our colleagues in the media and um, the public who may be watching this webcast, I hope with interest, this is only for one reason, in that we had a private excluded item at the last meeting and we just need to agree the minutes of it and it was only the first reading debate of the investment proposals, but we have to keep on the right side of the regulations, given it was a private item, its minute needs to be agreed in private. So have I the endorsement, the approval of the board 
to close the public meeting and just have one short final item, which is to agree those minutes. Thank you, I'm seeing hands up. Thank you very much. So if my IT support officers could close down the webcast and uh, confirm to me.